Good morning. Good morning. It's 10:15 uh, uh, Washington time, New Jersey time, East time, and 5:15 uh, Jerusalem time, Ramallah time, Haifa time, and Amman time. Welcome and good morning to all of you to our 20th Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation International Conference, highlighting together in faith. Jerusalem, our collective home. This year is special as it marks a milestone in our organizational life and our commitment to replace despair with hope, fear with human security, and humiliation with dignity. I'm Saliba Sarsar, chair of the HCF Committee on Research and Publication and professor of political science at Monmouth University in New Jersey. And I'm here with Dr. Stephen Corbin, former Special Olympics Senior Vice President of Community Impact and Support, who is a Living Faith Lutheran Church elder. Both of us will ensure that the conference runs smoothly and in a timely manner. On behalf of the SCF founder and president, Sir Rati Brabi, the board of directors and the conference planning committee, I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Saliba. It's a great uh, pleasure to work with you again on the conference. We've done this a few times before. Uh, 20 years goes very quickly, and uh, it's been an important 20 years, and, and we hope that there's another 20 or more years going forward. The conference this year is held in partnership with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, and Know Thy Heritage, uh, which is a program that was created uh, by the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation a number of years ago. We extend our heartfelt thanks to them for their support, especially Dr. Shahor Awade, the Deputy Permanent Observer of the OIC to the United Nations, and the KTH Board. Similarly, we express our gratitude to the Jerusalem Fund for education and community development and its executive director, Mohammed Mohammed, for hosting us. And also to Mohammed for making sure all of our electronic uh, communications uh, machinery here and far uh, work today. We thank all the volunteers and those who are taking notes for our presentations and discussions. This includes Dr. Carol Monica Burnett, Ms. Julia Pittner, and Ms. Janice Childress. We're streaming live, and we want to mention that the ideas and opinions that are shared at this conference really are the viewpoints of the presenters and speakers and not necessarily that of HCF, OIC, KTH, or the Jerusalem Fund. But I think if you listen carefully, you'll see the simpaticos that leak over between official positions and heartfelt positions there. So it's not like we're just strangers remaining strangers. We're here for similar purposes. Uh, I'm going to welcome now Sir Rateb Rabi. Uh, he is going to essentially lead the opening ceremony. Uh, Sir Rateb is a knight of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He was one of the four or five founders of HCF 20 years ago. He's the president and CEO, and sometimes I think the chairman, and the on-the-ground uh, uh, coordinator, everything else. He's a one-man show, and, and he really has a lot of energy, even after uh, 20 years. Uh, this opening session will also include uh, His Excellency, Agshin Mekidet, Mehidiev. This is not my native tongue. I'll get better as the day goes, goes on. Uh, he's the ambassador and permanent observer of the Organization of Islam Islamic Cooperation to the United Nations. Also His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Riyad Mansour, the permanent observer mission of the State of Palestine to the United Nations, and Her Excellency Dina Kawar, who's the ambassador the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Rateb. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm glad that you are all here. Um, 
I am in an awkward position with all these diplomats, and I have to try to, to do my part before they start in order uh, 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 to make them look good. Uh, <laughs> The thing here is that uh, we've been 20 years working on, on this uh, uh, advocacy and developments uh, uh, of, the, uh, of Jerusalem because we focus on like the diocese of Jerusalem which con uh, contain uh, Jordan and, and Palestine together. Uh, we work on the refugees, work on different things, you know, in Jordan, but on the other hand, that's we have about 20 programs and events around, around uh, Palestine and internationally. Uh, I don't want to bore you with what we do because you can see our websites and see what we do, but I'm here today, you know, about our 20th international conference where really we want to make sure this is about Jerusalem and um, with our partners, uh, OIC and uh, KTH in order to uh, 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 highlight the daily uh, uh, developments on Jerusalem because uh, we feel as, as, uh, as uh, uh, Palestinians, as an Arabs, as Muslims, Christians, and Jews, we got together, you know, today and, uh, today and tomorrow also in order to put our heads together and see how we can uh, make sure this, is, this Jerusalem is for all. And this is how Jerusalem is going to be something we are all belong to. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a clergy. You know, I'm not a politician. I'm not uh, uh, whatever you want to call this. I am a man with a mission, you know, where I want to make sure that we all understand that. We all, we need to, ch to make the changes, you know, uh, in order for people to understand what Jerusalem means to us as we uh, uh, want them to, uh, to, to look at it d differently, not what we hear in the news, what people decide about our faith, what people are... Uh, uh, looking at us as, as uh, uh, Christian, Muslims, or Jews, you know. Now, Jerusalem has to be shared, you know. This is what we believe in. Jerusalem has to have two people and three faiths, you know, and this is where all we are looking for. Uh, we don't want here, we need to share it, you know. You know, Jesus Christ, as a Christian, you know, he's uh, uh, the prophet who spent all his time and was crucified and died and raised, uh, you know, and that's all in, in, in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land, you know, I mean, in that area. That's mean we, 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 we cannot claim it just for us because of that, because every religion has, has a stake into it. Uh, I would like, you know, to, that to bring to, to your attention that, uh, um, you know, how we can from here, from this conference, as we, is not only, uh, it is the 20th uh, uh, anniversary for HCF, we made it special that we are working with a lot of uh, uh, partners beside the OIC, the main one who's their interest and their mission is, is to, and created because of Jerusalem, actually, you know, I just, uh, you know, this is which is something uh, uh, really astonishing when you hear that. The, the other thing is to have the Episcopalians, I have the Lutherans, I have the uh, uh, um, Presbyterians, did I say that again? You know, but you know, I have uh, uh, two, uh, the Catholics, uh, you name it, and the other uh, Muslims who are from different organizations too are with us. They come and go uh, through the two days in order to come up with, I don't know what the, the word is, task force, or something where we all, uh, Jews, Muslim, and, and Christians, uh, to work on Jerusalem for all, and we are hoping that this conference will be uh, uh, the, the start for, for that, such as things like that. Uh, I uh, want uh, to thank you again all for coming. I want you uh, uh, to, to hear our official uh, 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 statements from our ambassadors, because uh, after that we are going to get to work and see how we can make, make uh, things uh, better and get the word out. Uh, uh, it is like we said, live stream. It is a lot of people are watching us. And then we have already reached out thousands of people. We reached all the, all the churches. We reached out to all the mosques you know, in the country. 
and, uh, and Islamic centers, just to know that there's something happening here in Washington, not just, you know, we are here uh, coming together just to, 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 to spend two days talk about nothing. We need to come up with the results, and we have a lot of leaders, and I have over 25 organizations represented through, through the two days. I'm happy to have you here, and thank you very much for being with us. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Distinguished uh, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, friends, on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as co-organizer of this event, I welcome you all. I wish also to express our appreciation for the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation's proactive role in supporting justice for Palestine in general and Jerusalem in particular. I cannot fail to thank Surat Abrabe for his high spirit of cooperation and his team, especially all, uh, at the Know Thy Heritage Initiative for the excellent organization of this important event. Our thanks also go to all co-sponsors of the event and to the Jerusalem Fund for Education and Community Development for hosting our gathering. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Ambassador Riyad Mansour and Ambassador Dina Kawar for their presence with us. We are very uh, proud to have this wide spectrum of partners. Our partnership for holding this conference today falls within the context of raising a joint voice in support of the city that brings us all together, Jerusalem. As certainly expected, one of the key themes that will probably be raised during this two-day conference in the significance of Jerusalem, is the significance of Jerusalem for the believers of all faiths all over the world. For Muslims, Jerusalem is a sacred and uh, sanctified uh, place as it is the first Gibla. It's the city of which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, led all prophets in a prayer during this nocturnal journey known as Al-Isra wal Miraj. It was in this uh, journey that the Prophet received the divine revelation about the second pillar of Islam, which is to pray five times a day, a ritual performed for more than 14 centuries by more than one and a half billion Muslims all over the world. While the spiritual significance of Jerusalem for the modern atheist, uh, atheistic religion will be touched upon by several speakers from different faiths during our conference, I would like to stress that Muslims' attachment to Al-Quds, Jerusalem, is deep and unshakable. In this sense, I would like to offer a fresh reminder that the cause of Al-Quds was the main catalyst for the very creation of the OIC about five decades ago. Al-Quds was then our organization first and foremost cause its very raison d'etre and has been ever since the top item on its agenda. Bringing justice to al quds the protection and preservation of its Christian and Muslim holy places and shrines, the maintenance of its indigenous Palestinian identity and its historical, cultural and civilizational landmarks, as well as the staunch campaign to ensure its rightful return to the Palestinian sovereignty in conformity with the relevant international legitimacy resolutions have been and shall always be the prime objectives in inspiring and propelling the OIC endeavors forward. Ladies and gentlemen, the late Palestinian leader, Faisal Husseini, once said, I quote, if free and enjoying justice, Jerusalem can be the warm sun of the Middle East, but if not, it can become the black hole which can swallow everything, including the hope for peace." End of the quote. <coughs> the distressing truth, however, is that Jerusalem is anything but the son of the Middle East. The city of the prophets is a sad and torn town and the suffering of its indigenous population. 
Muslim and Christians goes beyond any imaginable depth. For more than five decades, Jerusalem's identity as a place for all believers have been, has been relentlessly targeted with cruel Israeli attempts aimed at falsifying its history, tampering with its demographic fabric, and imposing an exclusive Jewish character on its uh, authentic personality. Our meeting today comes at a time when the city of Jerusalem, which gathered all humanity in one ground, has lost its beauty. And in contrast with the name, Jerusalem has now become known for the unjust and unfair action of Israel. Therefore, the situation in occupied East, uh, East Jerusalem remains a major concern for the OIC and its 57 member states. Israel violations in the Holy City are palpable and could readily be identified by the unprecedented intensification of Israeli extremism and soldiers, which has gone out of proportion in fiercely targeting the authentic character of the occupied city. Israel has systematically adopted political, demographic, and economic measures stated to alter the authentic historical and civilizational identity of East Jerusalem, Judaizing it, perverting its character, changing its landmark, depleting it from Palestinians, and isolating it from its Palestinian geographical environment. The sad reality is that religious rights of Palestinian citizens, Christians, and Muslims are severely violated by the occupying power. Due to the harsh Israeli measures, including the apartheid wall and military barriers, the vast majority of Palestinian <coughs> Muslims and Christians from the West Bank and Gaza cannot reach their respective holy places in East Jerusalem. In addition, mosques and churches in Jerusalem have suffered from assaults and restrictions. Al-Aqsa Mosque, for example, was closed a number of times single last year by the Israeli military authorities. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was also targeted with several assaults. Last week, millions of people around the world watched the video showing Israeli police forces insulting and attacking Christian monks of the Coptic Church in East Jerusalem. Additionally, several Christian and Muslim religious endowment properties have been expropriated by the Israeli occupation authorities for building or expanding colonial settlements in and around Jerusalem. I am not going to burden you with uh, figures and statistics about the situation in occupied East Jerusalem, and I will leave that for our knowledgeable speakers who will educate us on the state of affairs in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, for the sake of deliberation, I will mention a few examples about how Jerusalem is losing its uh, multidimensional character due to a willful policy by the occupying power. For example, <coughs> Israel has taken every measure to manipulate the demographics of occupied East Jerusalem by seeking to create a Jewish minority. This has been pursued through enacting discriminatory legislations, exploiting urban planning, and imposing several restrictions on residents' rights for the Palestinians. It's very upsetting to know that as a result of systematic policy, 123 Palestinian housing units were destroyed in 2016 alone and more than 15,000 Palestinian homes where 100,000 Palestinians reside, representing a third of the Palestinian <coughs> houses in Jerusalem remain under the threat of demolition. At the same time, expropriated Palestinian land had been utilized for the construction of Israeli colonies, eventually leading to a sharp increase in the number of settlers who outnumber Palestinians in the city. Israel has been frantically suppressing any non-Jewish manifestation of Al-Quds, including the vital sectors that are a direct and integral component of the daily life of Palestinians. Ironically, Palestinians in East Jerusalem are required to pay taxes like Israel settlers, but do not receive the same services. Education, for instance, has been suffering such a dearth of financial resources that school buildings in East Jerusalem are in state of dilapidation. The Israeli human rights organization, Iramin, estimates that uh, as of 2017, 
there is a shortage of 2,557 classrooms in Palestinian neighborhoods, and about a third of the children do not complete 12 years of schooling. You can imagine the type of generation that is intended uh, for the Jerusalem limits by having intentional Israeli restriction on education. The healthcare sector in East Jerusalem, too, is by no means in a better shape. <coughs> Due to Israel's cramping policies, Palestinian hospitals and community clinics in East Jerusalem have undergone e extreme hardships that continue to hinder their ability to provide adequate healthcare to the Palestinian citizens. Hospitals, which are the main healthcare provider for the Palestinians, are under-equipped and need urgent upgrades. In addition, while Palestinians make up to 40% of Jerusalem population, the Israeli municipality runs only six family health centers in the Palestinian neighborhoods, as opposed to 27 centers in Jewish uh, neighborhoods. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have mentioned are but a few examples of Israeli attempts to impose on the city an exclusive Jewish identity. What makes things worse for Jerusalem is the blind support that Israel receives from certain groups and states. Accepting Israel's jurisdiction over Jerusalem and recognizing it as a Israel's capital will only fuel injustice. For the OIC, Jerusalem is the core of Palestinian existence, history and culture, and the cornerstone of peace. Taking it off the table is tantamount to taking peace off the table. Accepting Israel's illegal occupation of the city only means enforcing injustice, rewarding lawlessness, and punishing the victim. Is Jerusalem is part of the occupied Palestinian land, capital of the state of Palestine, and should be dealt with in conformity of international legitimacy resolutions. I would not emphasize enough that it is incumbent on us all, Muslim and Christians, laity and clergy, individuals and states, to do our best to restore the inclusiveness that Jerusalem represents. It's the duty of all of us to work together to safeguard the authentic identity of the city, which was gifted to humanity by God. It's our duty to make sure that the city enjoys its multicultural identity. It's the city that belongs to us all and should be served by all of us. Our final call is that we should work together to build a global coalition to educate the entire world about the suffering of East Jerusalem under occupation and the oppression the Palestinian Jerusalemites endure therein. I thank you for your attention. Good morning. Good morning. Allow me at the beginning to uh, express our gratitude to the organizers of this uh, 20th International Conference and also to express my personal gratitude to my brother Rati Brabia for inviting me uh, to represent the people and leadership of the State of Palestine and to be with you in this uh, very important conference. Allow me also to uh, thank you, or not to thank you, to congratulate you for uh, convening this 20th uh, conference for your organization. And also I'm delighted that I am sharing the uh, podium with colleagues. Dina is my sister and she is uh, my good friend, we served together in New York when she was the PR of Jordan in New York and she is in Washington, D.C. And uh, it is always uh, a delightful thing to see you, Dina, and to uh, share with you uh, things that are in, uh, very important uh, to both of our people and leadership. And by that I mean the question of Jerusalem. Of course, you know, Afshin is a good friend, and uh, we work together in New York, and uh, we appreciate what the OIC has been doing 
in uh, defending Jerusalem and the just cause of the Palestinian people. Of course, I'm not going to educate you about uh, the value and importance of Jerusalem for people uh, of faith, especially for those who aspire to uh, Christianity. You are better educated than me of the meaning of Jerusalem and the holy value of that uh, city which belongs to humanity and which is uh, a place that by many theologians uh, is considered as the uh, holiest uh, house of God when he decides to come to earth. It is, uh, in Arabic, we call it by Tilmaqdis, it is the holy house. It is uh, the holy house for uh, those who follow the three religions. So I am not going to dwell on uh, the importance of Jerusalem. But what I want to concentrate my uh, remarks about is related to what is really happening to Jerusalem today and what should we all do in order to uh, put an end to this tragedy that the Palestinian people have been going through for more than 70 years since the Nakba and 50 years since the occupation. And also to find a, a just, fair solution to the question of Jerusalem uh, based on international law, uh, based on fairness and justice, and based on making it uh, a city for all those who would love to have a spiritual connection with it. We cannot deny billions of people to have spiritual connection with Jerusalem. But we, what we object to is that that connection should not be translated into a real state control of the city. The city belongs to the people who live in the city and own the properties, own the history, and they have been living there for hundreds and hundreds of years. That is the... Uh, the connection for those who live there. But if you are from Indonesia and you are a Muslim, you have the full right to have a spiritual connection with Jerusalem. If you are from Chile and you, uh, you have the full right to have a spiritual connection with Jerusalem, and if you are from Warsaw and you are Jewish, you have the full right to have a spiritual connection with that city, but that should not translate into a group to come and to take it from the people who have been living there for a long period of time under any kind of logic and uh, explanation to justify that action. This has nothing to do with the essence of religion. It has nothing to do with the essence of spiritual connection with this holy city. It has to do with many other things, and you know exactly what I mean by that. Now, what is the status of Jerusalem in contemporary, in contemporary uh, today as it relates to international law? It was decided in 1947 that the international community, justly or not justly, when they decided to uh, uh, partition Palestine into three pieces, two states and a special status to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is a very sensitive issue, not only to the two people, the Israelis and the Palestinians, but it is a very sensitive, important issue to humanity. And those who decided you know, to partition Palestine and to create an inter international administration for Jerusalem at that time, uh, they realized that keep Jerusalem that way until the situation is ripe where the two peoples and humanity as a whole can find a solution where Jerusalem will be the jewel of humanity and the capital of everything good that all of us aspire to. Now, after that, uh, Israel not only uh, took most of Palestine, 78% in 1948-49, but in 67, took the remaining part of Palestine, including East Jerusalem. International law stipulates that uh, 
the status of the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem, is occupied territory, regardless of what Israel thinks, regardless of the articulation of the position of Israel based on things that perhaps dates back to uh, thousands of years ago, uh, the status according to international law, according to the United Nations that we collectively created after World War II is an occupied territory. And also, the Charter of the UN, which is a, a fabulous uh, uh, document that regulates relationship between nations and people on the basis of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of land by force and on the basis of trying to resolve complicated issues and disputes through peaceful measures in order to save humanity from having wars similar to the one that happened in World War I and in World War II. Noble ideas. And we collectively uh, reach an agreement that was signed in San Francisco in 1945 by the nations that established the United Nations. So this collective uh, effort that was uh, translated into this fabulous document, which is the Charter of the United Nations, it is not a book or a document that you read it when you like, you accept it when you like, and you throw you throw it in the garbage when you like. It doesn't work that way. That is the rule of those who are not civilized. That is the rule of the jungle. That is the rule of might is over right. And we should not accept it, because if we accept such an articulation, then why did we establish the United Nations to begin with? So having said that, then rooted in that document, which is not a document that we, the Palestinian people, created, drafted, or played an instrumental role in adopting it. It was other countries led by the United States of America. So we believe, and many nations believe, that this document should be honored and respected. Based on that document, the land that was occupied on the 4th of June 1967, which constitute for us the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip is an occupied territory, and this occupation should be of a temporary nature and should be terminated, and the relationship between the people who live under occupation and the people who are occupying them, or the government that, uh, that represent the occupying authority should be guided by a set of international rules and regulations that would allow the occupiers to do certain things and would forbid them from doing other things. One of the things that they're not allowed to do is to annex East Jerusalem. One of the things that are, they're not allowed to do is to transfer population from their country, from Israel, to the occupied Palestinian territory and to establish illegal settlements. So this is the law. And we are not uh, inventing something that Israel can claim that this is the invention of the thinking of the Palestinian people. This is international law. This is what all nations should honor and respect. And this is, by the way, a condition for countries and states to qualify to be member of the United Nations. Now, after 67, I said, by the early 80s, Israel, the occupying power decided to annex East Jerusalem. That was not accept, accepted by the entire international community. It was not accepted by the Security Council, which adopted two resolutions, 476, and 478, which one stipulates that any change, any legal change of the status of Jerusalem is null and void, and it has no legal ramification. And the other one stipulates that if a state to violate this law and to move its embassy 
from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it should take it back to Tel Aviv immediately. In fact, in the early in the 80s, two states violated international law, Costa Rica and uh, El Salvador, and moved their embassies to Jerusalem. And then years later, these two states honor and respected international law and their obligation under the provisions of the Charter of the UN and removed their embassies back from Jerusalem to uh, Tel Aviv. It was tragic and sad and dangerous to see a country of the magnitude of the United States of America to violate US policies that have been put in place since 1945 and since 1947 because the United States of America was the country that drafted Resolution 181 that gave Jerusalem a special status until there is a readiness by humanity to accept a solution uh, by all of us, by the Palestinians, by the Israelis, by the Arabs, by the Jordanians, by uh, humanity as a whole to the question of Jerusalem. And that was the policy of the United States of America all along. And the United States of America did not veto Resolution 476 and 478 or Resolution 2334, which was adopted in December 23 of 2016, which stipulates the principles that I mentioned contained in the Charter of the UN in the inadmissibility in of the acquisition of land by force and that the border is the 4th of June 1967, including, of course, East Jerusalem being occupied. And any change to that situation will not be uh, accepted unless the two parties, through negotiation, to agree to some changes of the borders. So this is international law. This is the position of the international community. And that is the position that should be respected by everyone, including the leadership of the United States of America uh, and all others who say that they respect the rule of law, they honor and respect international law, and they honor and respect the, uh, the, the position of law in regulating relationship between nations and not to be a country to violate international law, to violate uh, Security Council resolutions and come and lecture the rest of us saying that they're doing the right thing and the good thing when they interfere in this area or that area. Now, having said that, of course, in December 6, when the current U.S. administration decided to recognize uh, Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel and decided and implemented moving the embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, as I think that uh, Afshin said, if you remove Jerusalem from the table, there is nothing left on the table to talk about. And what is really uh, dangerous about this thing, you give this gift to the Israeli occupying authorities in exchange of nothing. And you claim that you do that along with removing the refugees from the table trying to destroy UNRWA and therefore removing it from the table and tell us, and, and in the same time, we are told that this would help peace. How could it help peace when you give the Israeli occupying authority, this extreme rightist government in Israel, all these gifts for nothing? What is the incentive for Prime Minister, Minister Netanyahu to come and negotiate with us? Any sane person any reasonable person, if you want to give a gift to someone for the purpose of inducing them to move in the direction of peace, you let them pay a price. But when you give it to them for free, why should they come and participate in any meaningful process? And because of this kind of irresponsible, provocative policy, the current Israeli government went even one step further they haven't done that in 70 years, but they did it recently in legislating the nationality law in which they are legislating uh, the, uh, a system of segregation 
apartheid in Israel in which only uh, one uh, component of uh, the population is allowed to practice self-determination, which is the Jews, depriving 25% of the population in Israel from such a thing, along with those who live in East Jerusalem and the Palestinian people who live in the rest of the occupied territory, because the same, the same piece of legislation of nationality stipulates that it is the responsibility of the government of Israel to advance uh, the cause of the Jews in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, it means the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. Now, we observe the situation, what should we do? And here I'm addressing you as uh, active members in society in the United States, and I assume many of you are active follower of uh, the Christian faith. You have brothers and sisters in Palestine who are Christians. They are in Jerusalem, they are in Bethlehem, they are in many other towns and villages in Palestine who are Christian. They have been there for 2,000 years. And we, the Palestinians, regardless of our uh, religious affiliation, we are the descenders of uh, the Canaanites. We've been living there for 5,000 years or longer. And we, the majority of us, at one time accepted a new religion that came to us through uh, uh, Abraham, which is Judaism later on. And then the majority of us became Christian, and then the majority of us became, you know, Muslims. But we are the people of that land, and to deny us the right to self-determination as the indigenous population is uh, uh, nothing to be uh, described other than apartheid. Apartheid in the last 200 years was defeated by humanity at least in two uh, large locations. One, when there was slavery in the United States and the system of segregation, the movement in the United States of civil rights, maybe many of you were active members of that movement, defeated that system of segregation and discriminating against people on the basis of the, col the color of their skin and you elevated yourself to a remarkable level when you e elected an Afro-American as a president of your country. It means that you were striving to be a better union, better United States of America. That is remarkable, that is inspiring. And then when this system was legislated in South Africa, it did not last for long and it was defeated. Now it has been legislated for the third time in uh, contemporary history in Israel, and I can assure you it will be defeated, and you are invited to do everything possible in order to contribute to that process. You are a very influential group of people. The people of faith are not only the evangelicals in certain parts of the South and in other parts of the United States of America. There are millions more who are of different denominations. You have a duty to defend Jerusalem, to make it the city for all of us, not to concede that it was given to only one group at the expense of others, at the expense of humanity. You have a duty, you have a responsibility to do that with all the people that you come in contact with, whether you are elected officials or your uh, congregations and you, the people that come to your place of worship, you have a duty not just only to listen to uh, information about what is just and what is not just, although this is important, but you have to take the additional step of uh, doing things in order really not to uh, let the Palestinian people be in this predicament alone, but to do whatever you can to correct this wrong policy by the current U.S. administration and to leave Jerusalem on the table, it is after all one of the final status issues and it should be dealt with after we put an end to occupation and to have two states living side by side in peace and dignity and then we deal with all final status issues including Jerusalem to find a solution not only acceptable to the two people and to the two states 
but acceptable to humanity as a whole. It is not an easy task, but it is a task that we have to accomplish if we want to honor and respect Jerusalem and to give it the place that it deserves in our hearts and minds and in the history of humanity. We count a lot on you. We had conferences in this country. I attended one in Atlanta in the center of President Carter in which the five heads of our churches in Jerusalem came and met with heads of churches in the United States of America. We had a conference recently in Houston with different churches in the United States. Conferences and meetings are taking place among uh, Christian faith in all corners of the United States of America. It should be galvanized in a very formidable movement. You are strong. You can influence people. You have a duty to do it. And you have to influence also the government, not only to, uh, you know, to accept that, uh, well, let's pray for Jerusalem, and that's enough. That is not enough. You have to do more than that. And I speak to you from the essence of the pain of the Palestinian people, from the essence of the pain of your brothers and sisters who are Christians in the Holy Land and who are Muslim in the Holy Land to defend Jerusalem and to open doors for a meaningful uh, political process that would lead to the end of occupation, the independence of the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital. And I thank you very much. Thank you. That was interesting. I know uh, Riyadh from my days in uh, New York, and we worked so much together on, on the issue of Jerusalem. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, Rata, for inviting me and including me in today's uh, event, 20th anniversary, I suppose, and uh, to everybody who's here, including the, my fellow uh, colleagues, ambassadors. Um, I Obviously, the question of Jerusalem has been uh, explained and uh, in quite a uh, uh, extensive manner. So I only would want to add one aspect, which is Jerusalem's, uh, the Jordanian Hashemites um, role in Jerusalem, and it has been a historic uh, role. As most of you know, the Hashemite family has been guardians of the holy places. It's a historical role that has been uh, ongoing since 1924 and it includes the Muslim as well as the Christian uh, places. And uh, with our Palestinian um, neighbors and, and uh, family, we uh, really actually run uh, Jerusalem in, in the most uh, um, uh, efficient manner. In, and our policy is that we hope that one day East Jerusalem will be the capital of Palestine, and then we would be able to have saved and uh, the holy places. Uh, the His Majesty and President Abbas in 2013 met and redefined the role and re, uh, actually I wouldn't say redefined, but reaffirmed the role of the Hashemites as custodians and as uh, uh, the partners to uh, make sure that the holy places are well kept. Um, Jordan has also, in the same aspect, in 1981, uh, registered and inscribed the old city of Jerusalem on UNESCO's World Heritage uh, um, uh, site as a site, and in 1982 as a site in, uh, in danger, which is a specific uh, category within the UNESCO uh, statuses to, make to explain that uh, there needs to be an extra effort uh, to safeguard the holy places. Now, Throughout the years, the resolutions within the UN are known. The security, the and the in both uh, uh, the executive board and in the World uh, Heritage, uh, we've done many resolutions, and um, I've worked very long years on those resolutions as uh, 12 years in UNESCO ambassador uh, with my Palestinian uh, colleagues, and we uh, all these efforts in. Uh, most and all of the resolutions, and especially the latest ones, reaffirmed that all legislative and administrative measures and actions taken by Israel, the occupying power, which have altered or purport to uh, alter the character and the status of the holy city of Jerusalem, are null and void and must be uh, resigned forthwith. 
Now, um, we believe that the status of Jerusalem, as mentioned before me, is one of the final status. It's the same position that we have with uh, what Riyadh mentioned and what my colleague from the OIC mentioned, and that it can only be uh, discussed and uh, negotiated in a final status, uh, Jerusalem. I want to also remind um, the Christian uh, members assisting uh, today in the conference that the, holy, the Christian holy sites are also under our uh, care and His Majesty did in 2016 uh, put in his personal contribution to support the funding and the re restoration of Christ's holy tomb in the, in the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So this for him, the question of Christians in Jerusalem is vital because they are uh, the reminder of what the city architecture is and the city architecture of it having the three religions is major and has to maintain that way. So we are saddened much of the time to see that the number of Christians in Jerusalem are, is decreasing uh, continuously. The figures I have here is about three, 300 thousand plus, I don't know if Riyadh, is that the, the figure that you have of yeah, uh, right. in Jerusalem? Uh, the total population of... Uh, yeah, the Christian... <coughs> yeah, the total is 300 and... Yeah. How much? 40% yeah. Palestinian, Christian and Muslim. Yeah. 40% of the total population. Yeah. <laughs> so... 10,000 Christians, 300,000 Muslims. Exactly. So, the, but the numbers of Christians are decreasing uh, for economic reasons as well, and most of the time uh, the, uh, the departure of Christian, uh, Christians in Jerusalem is for economic reasons, and they end up in the United States and Canada, and they have the, you know, uh, d diminishing the number of, of the Christians there. So um, I think this is what I have to say as from the Jordanian point of view, because the uh, historical, the political aspects have been touched upon by, by Riyadh, but all to say that, um, uh, we're hoping that uh, the, there would be a return as soon as possible to some kind of a, a peace track between both the Palestinians and the Israelis, and in which us, Jordan, we feel highly um, concerned because many of these status issues, the final status issues, do touch on Jordan, be it in the refugee issues, be it in borders, be it in uh, security, be it in the issue of Jerusalem and our role uh, in Jerusalem. So. Um, uh, I would be uh, very curious and interested to follow from far about your deliberations this time and see how it goes. Thank you so much. <laughs>